On the sunny morning of October 14, 1947, Major Charles E. Yeager flew the experimental Bell X-1 research plane at a speed of 700 miles per hour, breaking the sound barrier for the first time in the history of flight. It was perhaps the greatest physical breakthrough since the atomic bomb, and alongside that nuclear advance, it ushered in a new era of mankind's dominance over the seemingly insurmountable forces of nature. A few months later, as humanity began looking to the stars for a new frontier, another pilot, Captain Thomas F. Mantell, died in a terrible accident over Kentucky. The next day, newspapers around the country, and indeed around the whole world, reported what happened, that Mantell had died chasing a UFO. This captured the public's imagination, as it now appeared that mankind might not rule the heavens after all. have gone missing in the mines deep beneath the base of Mount Aso. One miner, Shigeru, is determined to investigate the cause, and he quickly discovers that there are giant insects in the dark recesses of the deepest mine. While trying to fend them off long enough to recover the body of his friend, Shigeru falls victim to a collapse, after which he finds a giant egg that hatches an enormous prehistoric monster capable of flying beyond the sound barrier and wreaking havoc in the skies. Before we go any further, if you could hit that like button, it will help this channel go supersonic. If you want to see more videos like this, don't forget to subscribe as well. Thank you in advance. With that out of the way, let's get back to the subject at hand. In 1956, after Godzilla proved to be a massive international phenomenon, Toho Studios and producer Tomoyuki Tanaka turned to its director, Ishiro Honda, telling him it was time to make another giant monster movie. Toho poured more money into this new project and planned from the start to film it in color. Tanaka hired the writer Ken Kuronuma, notable for his work translating American mysteries, to write the story treatment. Inspired by Captain Mentel's well-publicized UFO incident, Kuronuma came up with a story about a supersonic flying creature who, like Godzilla, is awakened by nuclear testing. Takeshi Kimura and Takayo Murata then adapted the story into a full script, adding in a second creature along with enormous prehistoric insects allegedly inspired by the American giant ant film, Them. Them! The script initially called for a beast reminiscent of the more bird-like Archaeopteryx, but this was later changed so that it would be more reptilian in appearance, closer to the Pteranodon, which is where its name, Radon in the Japanese version, derives from. The name was later changed by American distributors to the more familiar Rodan, probably to avoid confusion with the radioactive element radon. I've come across a rumor that there was a brand of soap called radon too, but I haven't been able to find it in my research. I did find a distressing number of other radioactive health and beauty products from the 50s though. The job of realizing the creature, which we'll just agree to call Rodan from now on, went to Godzilla alum Aiji Tsuburaya who was given 60% of the film's production budget to play with. Dealing with a flying creature as opposed to one that stomps over cities was both a liberating relief and a difficult technical challenge. On the plus side, the flying monster made it easier to have multiple miniatures of various scales, as the man-in-the-suit version of Rodan didn't have to interact with the environment as much as Godzilla had. The largest miniature was an enormous one-third scale model of the erupting volcano, which used smoking molten iron to simulate the lava flows. During the filming of the Mount Aso sequence on a smaller miniature, one of the wires holding one of the Rodan models snapped, and the puppeteer flailed helplessly to get the model out of danger as it fell into the iron and began to burn. This was ultimately kept in the final film, as it looked remarkably like the Rodan was struggling in its death throes. There were some predictable negatives to having a flying creature as well, for example, in the scene where Rodan stands on a department store, they had to build the model using real steel so that it could support the man in the 150-pound suit. When in flight, that same suited man had to be hoisted by cables, which, much like the wires holding up the model Rodan over the miniature volcano, failed multiple times, and at least once, they nearly cost veteran Godzilla actor Haruo Nakajima his life. The scene in question involved the destruction of the Nishikai Bridge, and because of various logistical issues, it could only be filmed once. 
As Nakajima in the Rodan costume hung over the model bridge, the pulley holding the cables broke and he fell roughly 20 feet into the water. Even though the costume and the water cushioned his fall, his suit quickly became waterlogged and Nakajima could easily have drowned. This shot was also kept in the final film, and the accident didn't stop the actor from continuing to do suit work for various Toho monsters in the years that followed. Side note, 2019's Godzilla King of the Monsters, which also features Rodan, is dedicated to Haruo Nakajima, who died in 2017. For the human characters, Honda hired as his leads the young Kenji Sahara and Yumi Shirakawa, who were touted in Rodan's publicity releases as Toho's Great Hope for 1957. Honda became so enamored with the pair that he would use them again in his films The Mysterians and The H-Man. Also present is Honda staple Akihiro Hirata as the paleontologist Dr. Kashiwagi. And as the reporter Izeki is Yoshifumi Tajima, who would later play the memorable villain of Mothra vs. Godzilla. Rodan released, in December of 1956, to notable success in Japan. But like Godzilla, it really found its legs on the international market. The American studio, King's Brothers Productions, recut the film, adding in some stock footage, rearranging scenes, and cleverly editing in the second Rodan much earlier in the film, and dubbed it into English with a handful of Asian American voice actors. One of those actors, and the only one of Japanese descent, was a 20-year-old George Takai, many years before he'd become famous in Star Trek as Sulu. The dub includes an overwrought voiceover narration along with a few unnecessary name changes, but as American redubs of foreign movies of the 50s go, it's far from the worst. This version of the film, released by the Distributors Corporation of America, or DCA, in August of 1957, made upwards of $500,000 on its opening weekend in New York, a box office record for any science fiction film at the time. In its entire run, it would become one of DCA's biggest hits, with some reports indicating it totaled as much as $10 million, which would make it one of the top five grossing films of the year. Let's get one thing straight, though. Rodan is no Godzilla. I enjoy the movie as a product of its time and appreciate it as part of Toho's giant monster legacy, but as a film on its own merits, it doesn't feel as poignant or innovative as its Tokyo-stomping predecessor. Part of that can be chalked up to the fact that Godzilla came first, but even taking that into account, the narrative of Godzilla is just tighter and more well done. Rodan may have a bigger budget and more spectacular effects overall, but its themes are more muddled, its plot is badly disjointed, and its human characters aren't quite as endearing. I'm willing to concede the possibility that this may be a byproduct of the film's Americanization, because I reluctantly admit I don't currently have a copy of the Japanese original to compare it to. Even taking that into consideration, though, there are some flaws that can't be explained away by a cinematic butchering. Rodan does offer lip service to the nuclear fears that spawned Godzilla, but at the same time, Rodan feels more generalized, more intent to draw parallels about human progress as it relates to conquering nature. While trying to reinforce those dangers, though, it offers a resolution where mankind prevails by conquering nature. There is a genuine philosophical conflict at the heart of Godzilla, with Dr. Serizawa and the Oxygen Destroyer, but Rodan has no such thematic tension. Instead, the guns, tanks, and brute force that were so useless against the King of the Monsters are ultimately effective against Rodan, which feels almost counterproductive to the common themes of these early Japanese kaiju flicks. With all that said, Rodan is still an important and perfectly entertaining entry in that particular canon. It may not reach the impossibly high bar of the original Godzilla, but it is certainly better than the big guy's first sequel, Godzilla Raids Again, and 1958's disastrous Varan the Unbelievable. I know it sounds like I'm being a bit harsh on him, but to be honest, Rodan is one of my favorite monsters in the greater Godzilla universe, and he doesn't get nearly enough love. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. Who's your favorite Toho monster not named Godzilla? It's Mothra, isn't it? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you really do like what I'm doing, consider joining my Patreon to get bonus content, vote on future topics, and more. You can also check out my website at emagill.com, where you'll find written reviews of plenty more sci-fi classics in both film and literature. Until next time, though, when we'll have to put up with an alien who insults Mickey Mouse, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody.
monsters.